Good evening from Los Angeles. My name is Charlie Coker. I'm the executive director of Asia Society of Southern California. Welcome to our program, exploring the differences between how the East and West approach esports. Um, I'm really looking forward to an amazing and exciting discussion today, an informative discussion. And uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this for this evening, uh, Miles, Lin, Miles Yim, excuse me. Uh, Miles is a former esports journalist for ESPN and the Washington Post, and currently with the Story Mob, and uh, someone well versed and well experienced to take us on the journey through esports. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Miles. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charlie. Hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world. I am indeed Miles Yim, and we've got a good panel here for you as part of Asia Society's Wider Entertainment Summit. We're going to go back into the wide, exciting world of esports uh, and explore the differences, I think, between how the East and the West approaches this very uh, expansive, somewhat arcane subject. Uh, for the East, a bit of clarification because it matters. We're only going to be covering China, South Korea, Hong Kong, uh, and Taiwan. So not to lump all the Asian countries together as people are want to and incorrectly to do. Uh, what essentially our goal is, is to sort of explore this assumption that for some reason, esports is more resonant, more acceptable, more prevalent in these Asian countries than it is in the West, that for some reason it has reached a level of popularity that it hasn't in North America and Canada and Europe. And to sort of explore that hypothesis, if it's true, if it's not true, I am joined by three excellent panelists who can lend fantastic insight to all of this. Uh, Walter Wong Jr. is the head of operations at TSM, an esports organization based, based in North America. John John Oliverius is the president of Various Ventures LLC and author of the China Esports Business News Digest. He's based in Alameda. And Sean Zhang, he is the CEO of Talent Esports, a esports organization based in Hong Kong. They compete in a variety of esports like Overwatch, Arena Valor, and League of Legends, amongst other titles. League of Legends is going to probably be our main focus when we talk about esports, but of course there are many titles amongst many other games. And I want to start with League of Legends, specifically the recent event that took place uh, throughout the month of October, a little bit September, a little bit November. Actually, it was the 31st. It didn't go into November. The League of Legends World Championship that took place in Shanghai not too long ago. Uh, it was a culmination of the year's season across the world for all of the many regions that compete in League of Legends. And it was, by all accounts, a fantastic event and rather unprecedented because it was held in Shanghai in a bubble amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And John, I'm going to start with you. I've heard a lot of tell, and I obviously watched the League of Legends World Championship uh, personally about how massive this event was and how it's one of the marquee esports uh, events on any calendar, any year. From your perspective, like what 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 backs up that assumption? Why was it such a huge deal? What numbers do you have for me uh, to perhaps support that assumption? Hey, uh, thanks, Miles, and uh, thanks to Asia Society for having me. It's a real honor to be here with this uh, just amazing panel. Um, let me, if you don't mind, let me take it a little bit back because in 2017, uh, China hosted uh, you know, the League of Legends World Championship, uh, known as Worlds, um, and they hosted it in uh, Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing to a crowd of 40,000 and jaws dropped all over the world. And it was really, you know, that was uh, certainly, I, I had a friend who sent me, who was working the event and sent me pictures of it. And I was just astonished. Um, and I think that that for a lot of people uh, really woke them up to the idea that, yeah, Chinese, China takes uh, League of Legends pretty seriously. Um, 2019, Fun Plus Phoenix, a uh, Chinese LPL team wins, uh, the, wins Worlds. Um, and, you know, 2020, so 2019 was a year of, uh, massive investment in esports in China and um, and real growth. And 2020 though was supposed to be kind of the big, uh, the, the really the biggest year in in many ways. Uh, and then COVID happened. So in February, um, February late February late February, at a time when uh, the virus hadn't spread 
uh, or it had it wasn't obviously spread to the rest of the world, and nobody had yet uh, controlled the virus at that point. There wasn't yet any sort of instance of controlling the virus. Um, so it's a really scary time, right? That was a point. Uh, at that point, everything's getting canceled. Everything is, you know, rescheduled, whatever. Uh, but the Shanghai Municipal Authorities came out and they said, we're still going to do this. And it was really interesting. It was a little bit of a head scratcher at the time. Uh, fast forward to June. In June, obviously it's a global pandemic. Now the question is, well, of course, you know, why would you do this if you needed to bring people from all over the world into it? And they doubled down. They held another presser and the Shanghai Municipal Government again held another presser said, said, and, and gave some details on, on how they were going to do it. Um, and, you know, so, so there was this very strong kind of uh, governmental support, really wanting to, you know, continue to cement the idea of uh, China as, you know, really a, I, Shanghai as, as, as a capital for esports uh, in, in the world. And uh, really to do this amazing event, even though I mean, basically the government is okay canceling all live sports events for the year, still canceled, but is determined to make sure there's a way to do uh, esports live, to do, to do this event in particular. And there's been a couple of other live esports events, but this one was the biggest. So going into it, um, that was kind of the background. And so it was already pretty interesting that they were doing this and, and doing it in, in, as you said, uh, in the bubble, 14 day quarantines, 22 teams going in. Um, they managed to do it without fans, uh, most of it without fans in a uh, studio uh, that was uh, set up for the first extended reality um, uh, virtual world experience uh, as a live experience. This is based, this sort of uh, using the same uh, kind of technology based on Unreal Engine that um, uh, Disney uses to produce a Mandalorian, where you're using a lot of LED screens to basically create a virtual world and it, instead of just sort of superimposing graphics on something. And so that was a real innovation. Uh, they get a ton of viewership. Uh, up until the finals, but no fan experiences live. And, and, that, and to make up for the lack of fan experience, there was actually kind of a lot of offline experience uh, throughout the city. Um, but, the, but the live experience uh, was the finals. And for the finals, uh, the, they, the Worlds uh, became the first event at uh, Shanghai's new Pudong football stadium before you know, the football team that's supposed to be using it um, has even used it and they won't <laughs> for the rest of the year. Uh, but that, that became their first event. There was a, they had, um, it's the largest event so far with it, you know, small, but still large event so far, 6,000, I think 6,312 uh, people in attendance. Uh, they are lucky because they won out a, a free lottery for tickets that uh, reportedly 3.2 million people um, tried to get. Uh, so that, and now those finals, so those finals were, um, I, I looked this up, it was the second highest peak viewership of any esports match. The English, the English language feed was the highest peak, had the highest peak viewership of any esports match uh, looking at YouTube and Twitch, 3.88 3 million uh, viewers. Uh, but that uh, was dwarfed by the Chinese feed. Uh, the Chinese feed, which was, um, you know, Billy Billy had the rights to this and then sub licensed to a lot of other media. They reported peak live viewership at more than 300 million. Um, that just goes to show how, I mean, I think it, it's an indication of how massive the consumer base is for esports in China. Um, and I mean, the Chinese live streaming platforms, Huya, Douyu, uh, Billy Billy, they really dwarf, um, they really dwarf uh, YouTube and, and, uh, and Twitch. Um, and also the last thing I'll say about it is that, you know, the, the, the media rights to the championships uh, had been sold uh, in an exclusive media deal to Billy Billy uh, similar to the way, you know, media rights are sold in traditional sports uh, all, all the time. Uh, and it was kind of a landmark deal with Billy Billy paying reportedly 113 million uh, over three years 
uh, for 83 games. So that's a little over 1 million per game. Uh, obviously they see a lot of value in it and uh, you know, they, they look to make uh, as much out of it as they could. Yeah, those are staggering numbers and numbers that lead me to believe that it could it could only have been done in China. And I want to bring Walter in on this because we earlier had sort of a, a dry run experiment at perhaps a, a bubble in North America. That was around the midseason invitational and how it was originally supposed to be done in Los Angeles at the Forum. And that tournament completely fell apart. It was earlier in their pandemic. We were in the midst of a surge, much in the same way that we are now. And there was less information about it and all came together sort of, you know, slapdash and eventually didn't happen. Walter, I want to get your opinion on like why you think this, this bubble system that Shanghai, the Shanghai government was heavily involved in could or could not have been done in North America? Could it have been done anywhere else other than China as, as somebody who is with a North American organization? Why or why not? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think, I think, um, I think the Chinese government was, was for sure, uh, played a huge part in making it happen in China. Um, a bubble system like that is no easy task. And esports in, 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 in China is just much more, has, receives a lot more governmental support. Uh, that's just that's just the way it is, and so I think a bubble could have been done um, in North America. You obviously you saw the NBA do their bubble system in Florida to finish out the, the season and playoffs and finals, but um, but the organization, the leagues, you know, they didn't receive as much governmental support as 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 the one as China did. You know, the U.S. doesn't put as much of a focus on making sure that esports is front and center. Um, and you know, that's, that's just how, how it was. And so that's why we played all our playoffs and our finals matches for LCS, which is a North American league, uh, online from all, some teams played from their, their team houses. Some of the, some of the teams played from their, from their offices and, um, which was, if you talk to our players, not as fun, uh, and no, not as, uh, exciting, but we were able to at least pull through. Whereas a lot of traditional sports had to make, take long pauses in their seasons to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And Sean, as someone who's closer to this issue, uh, as a team who's based out of Hong Kong and has you know direct proximity to China and and the wider Asian region, what what has been your experience with the way that governments in Asia, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea support esports in a direct way? I even I've even heard whispers of sort of esports tourism popping up in some of these regions. Can you can you give us more insight on that? Yeah, I think it, I think esports tourism and the whole industry is something that is fundamentally really, really important for a lot of the governments that you kind of mentioned. If we look at the city of Shanghai, as John mentioned, they've put a huge emphasis on esports for both job growth, for youth employment, as well as just like future opportunities, right? Because the numbers are there, and I don't think the Chinese government can deny that. And the the mayor of Shanghai, she she fully supports it, right? You saw at the end of uh, Worlds in 2019, you know, Huan Yin Shanghai, which is basically well Welcome to Shanghai at the end of that show. I mean, I don't think any other mayor of any city would be so open to doing that. And you even saw the year before, like the TI in, in Shanghai, and they've packed out a 30,000 person stadium at the Mercedes Benz Arena for two weeks, and all the hotels in the surrounding areas were packed. And everyone, like, I wouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people took flights to Shanghai to experience that, right? And so you really see a lot of support from the government trying to make these happen. I can talk a little bit more about the Hong Kong government as well, because that's obviously where we're slightly tied. So you know, the Hong Kong government has a big push for sort of startups and uh, the esports ecosystem. So they actually have an incubation program where they take a lot of esports teams and, and businesses and basically give them support from the government. Now, Hong Kong government has set aside, I think, close to 100 million Hong Kong dollars a year, where they've basically, I think that's roughly 15 million US, where they use it to support uh, any sort of components of the esports ecosystem, whether it's tournaments, whether it's community tournaments, whether it's basically teams, whether it's any sort of digital production or basically support of any live events. And so they basically have thrown their whole weight behind it because once again, similar to what the Chinese government is thinking about is they want to use it as a form of you know, tourism, number one. And secondly, it's just as youth employment and job opportunities, they foresee it as a huge industry that can be sort of leveraged upon going forward when it comes to opportunities in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is very finance centric. So to have a newer industry such as esports that allows for kids to have broader job opportunities, I think that's really important. 
Taiwan is similar. I mean, we our legal agent team is based out of there, and you know we speak with the Taipei government, new Taipei government. I would even say like uh, one of the teams in the PCS J team is actually sponsored by uh, the new Taipei government. So you can actually see on their jersey they were called New Taipei J team, and that involves financial support, uh, you know, office locations, resources, all these type of things. And once again, it's very similar. They see it as an opportunity for youth employment and and tourism, right? Which is something that's really important. And they had. I think they had a stage at MSI the year year before, right, in 2019, and, and they filled out a stadium as well. So it's very, very similar. In Korea, I would say, once again, you know, you see certain municipals there. Like, for example, we've, uh, you know, had, like, Busan government has been big push, a big pusher of esports as well. You know, they sponsor teams directly. They build stadiums. They help them basically direct more resources to them, whether it be through sponsorships or other businesses within the region. So I would say generally most governments, uh, at least for the regions that you've discussed, and even broader Southeast Asia as well, are super open to this. And you know, like I use Indonesia as an example, like Jokowi. Prime Minister is a huge fan of esports and wants to support it from both a youth perspective. So I think that's perhaps a difference here is that you know the governments are behind it and they see it as a as a new industry that can be helped for employment as well as tourism perspective. Yeah, for sure. I just want to make a quick note here that we will be having a Q and A at the end of this. I forgot to sort of top that off at the beginning of the show. Please submit your questions uh, in the Q and A tab on the uh, Zoom Hangout. We'll be able to do that uh, in 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 a short amount of time. But uh, John, did you want to jump in here at all, or? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, to, just to add on to Sean's point, you know, back it up. The uh, the in. Get just a, a little bit more, a little bit more history or recent history. You know, two years is like a really long time. Um, in 2019, um, there was a, sort of a reshuffling of government agencies to look at you know video game, video game regulation, and um, there was kind of a restart. And in that, and in that restart after a, a after a, a long sort of license freeze, that just you know gaining to the game development side uh, and and the game industry side. Um, there, there was there was a period of uncertainty uh, for about nine months, and then um, and then 2019, uh, kind of the floodgates broke open, and there was a uh, a report that the uh, uh, ministry, I guess, I, I guess it's sort of like comparable to labor department. It's the Ministry of Human Resources uh, and and Social Services uh, put out this this report. And they analyzed uh, all these new professions, and they looked at esports in particular, and they made uh, uh, an assessment that they were going that there was going to be a need for two and a half million jobs in this sector uh, the next over the next five years, um, and that's actually been updated now to three and a half million. Uh, that was just updated in uh, I think July. Uh, so. Um, and that was actually also right on the heels of and, and related to it on the heels of of, of uh, China uh, sort of formalizing esports as a profession. So there's a, there's an actual you know there are two different kinds of occupations. There's one that's more you know players and coaches or team operations related, and then there's another uh, category that's operators and everything else. Uh, but yeah, so they looked at this you know kind of, kind of quantitatively, and then. You know that's really an interesting about thing about China, and I don't know how much that um, is reflected in the rest of Asia, uh, but it's not in in the West, which is which is that you know esports is a global game. It's it, it's it's a it's a global sport. Uh, the game is same played the same wherever it's played in a title, and global tournaments are you know kind of the most important tournaments in in, in a given title, but. Um, you know, it's also very much a kind of a ground up thing. You see it in colleges, you see it in organizations. Uh, it, it's, it, it, very, it, it very often or almost always has to have some sort of organic start. Um, and I think that's true in China as well, but in China, there's also this top down uh, look at it. And so when you say you need three and a half million jobs over five years, then the money begins to flow and preferential policies and subsidies get made at the local level. And when I say the local level, really in 2009, starting in, in yeah, 2018, 2019, uh, you know, Shanghai is uh, still kind of the, the, the biggest city on this, but there are other major cities that are all kind of vying to be, you know, an esports hub. Uh, so, you know, to, and then that also feeds back into this, um, 
you know, esports tourism is that you know, and you see that come up actually in the policies when they're announced is that oh one of the great effects of this would be that you know we'll be able to boost our esports tourism in other words we'll be a uh you know we'll have home venues built here uh for certain teams certain famous teams and uh that by the way is also an interesting thing there are home home venues for teams um uh, and and uh it will, we'll have home venues and we'll sponsor tournaments and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pay teams to say like, I'm settling in Wuhan, I'm settling in uh, Chongqing, you know? And, uh, and then uh, that from there, kind of all this other stuff begins to flow to the point where you even have, you know, um, educational systems. Like how do we create an academic path? Uh, colleges, uh, trying to figure out how to do, uh, how to create esports majors. I was on the phone with a friend of mine last night uh, with, uh, who works for an esports organization called Rift in, in China. And they are developing uh, esports academic programs with the universities and schools who are trying to, you know, kind of figure out how do we, how do we make a path? Um, and they're getting money to do it uh, from the, from the government. So yeah, so that, just that, that kind of top down aspect is is really a differentiator interesting thank you for jumping the gun on geolocation that is our yeah, next yeah, topic sorry. but before we before we get there before we get there uh walter i want to bring you in uh we've just heard a lot about how well supported a lot of the esports organizations in these countries in these asian countries are are and uh, the level of government involvement there the esports tourism how much money in government subsidy does TSM currently receive from the state of California, from the US federal government? Los Angeles is an incredible esports hub. It's, it's got so many big time developers based in this city. Uh, what kind of esports tours are, are being offered? What, what's your level of government subsidy? Well, I would say that, you know, we, it's, 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 a, it's a mission for, you know, the mayor's office right now in LA, uh, Eric Garcetti, which we have talked to, uh, to make LA the hub of esports for for los angeles right it's just so natural right riot games is there uh, overwatch team is there um activision blizzard ea all the game studios developers as well as most of the esports teams because we've had to congregate around la because of the overwatch league and the uh, lcs and so it's it's really the mayor's office is really mission to make la the, the hub of esports and they have given us support um especially around um our training facilities. Um, the, the TSM training facility was actually the first, technically the first training facility in the city of Los Angeles. Team Liquids was in the city of Santa Monica. So um, so we, we, we had the privilege of doing that. And so we got a lot of support from the government, the local government on, you know, making sure that we got all the right paperwork in, permits, expediting things for, for the build out and things like that. Uh, in terms of uh, monetary support, um, you know, that that may come in the future um, but right now it's 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 really about helping us uh, develop develop a better ecosystem so so the, the support will come in the future but it, it isn't it's it's not currently like to the levels of these uh, Asian countries is that correct yeah so I would say I said that for sure the Chinese government um, pushes pushes these sports a lot more um, and, and and they really want to make uh, and, and to be fair, to be honest, I mean, in, in League of Legends and things like that, they they kick our butts most of the time um, right now. But uh, hopefully we can we can we can you know challenge them in the near future. Hmm. Well, shifting back to China specifically, uh, John brought up the idea or the concept of geolocation, essentially, which is what we in America basically think of as traditional sports. The Boston Red Sox play in Boston. Los Angeles Lakers play in Los Angeles. The teams are city based. That's, you know, also the case for these League of Legends teams in China. John, could you go a little bit deeper into the idea of geolocation in China and the, and the system that they've created? Yeah, sure. I mean, there there is the, the, there's a version in the U.S. and and maybe Walt can can talk to that. But uh, in the in in China, it's it's sort of becoming the norm. Uh, so the LPL, which is uh, China's pro League of Legends league. Uh, has uh, 17 teams uh, that, you know, I, I guess they're not, so I, 
I, I, I hear they're, 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 I wouldn't call them technically franchise, but that's probably the closest thing is it, it, they, they're similar to a franchise. It's not true franchise franchising because it's a long-term partnership, uh, but you buy a seat uh, and these seats are, you know, in the LPL, they can be eight to 10 million. Uh, the LCK Korea's version also, uh, they recently uh, went to the same model and they had 10 teams. I think their, their going was 10 million as, as well. Um, and most of these teams are sited in Shanghai, but uh, others have home venues in other major cities. And, you know, going back to what I was saying before, um, I, you know, I, I think that, oh, and, you know, and, and, and also just real quick, it's not just a League of Legends thing. It's, it's, um, it's also true for Honor of Kings. And it's also true for Peacekeeper Elite. Now those are, um, those are mobile games. And mobile games are a whole thing in China, and those those two are uh, more lucrative than than league, and they're the most popular games in China. And the the leagues, uh, I mean, Honor of Kings is, you know, think about it. It's a it's a, a league for a mobile game with home venues uh, that are that you know, and and so its its teams are also sort of moving towards this kind of home venue structure and. Um, yeah, and that's a function of, uh, I, I think, to some extent, kind of this, uh, this, this, this local focus, or for these major cities where they say, uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna, you know, we'll, we'll give. Uh, there's a certain, there's a certain amount that we'll subsidize for for building venues, uh, for agreeing to site in a certain city, uh, to bring a tournament here, um, you know, things like that. And, Sean, I, I want to bring you back in here because we're gonna. Localization has certainly sort of taken off in China in a way that it doesn't feel like has been replicated in other regions of the world. And as uh, owner of a team who, or CEO of a team that participates in the over in the Overwatch ecosystem, you've had a chance to see sort of up close and personal the challenge of starting a localized league in the United States and essentially internationally because there are bases in uh, technically France, in England, in the United States, uh, in China and in South Korea. It was very much hampered by the pandemic this year. So it's difficult to grade them uh, fairly, but I think you can add insight to the approach taken by Activision Blizzard in creating these localized leagues and the challenges associated with that. Yeah, I think for Overwatch League, um, there were some success with some of the home stands last year. And obviously this year with the whole COVID thing, it, it didn't work. Um, my view of the Overwatch League and the localization for the city things is, you know, can you get local stars and, and local supporters to support that team? I think it's a little bit difficult when I look at Overwatch League when, you know, 70% of the players are from South Korea, right? I think that that's a difficulty, right? Because you look at New York Excelsior, like, if I lived in New York and I and I watched over League, Overwatch League, um, if excluding performances, why would I support that team, right? Like, are there any local stars or any players that I know originally that, that are popular? And I think um, that's something that uh, that has to be addressed. But I think it's a it's a minor thing. But I think obviously winning is important. A lot of the a lot of the fans want ha want to have winning teams. So I think if you do that, then it's not as bad. Now. When you look at uh, Overwatch, where we play in Overwatch contenders in Korea, and obviously there, there's a whole bunch of different uh, leagues that operate out of our region. We have Overwatch contenders China, we have Overwatch contenders Korea, and Overwatch contenders um, uh, Asia Pacific or Pacific, which covers basically all the countries excluding the ones that I mentioned in Australia. Um, what you have in regards to difficulty is just the fragmentation of games in this region. I think, um, you know, if you look at Southeast Asia and North Asia, and I know we're not supposed to talk about it, but just in regards to what John mentioned, like, for example, Southeast Asia, mobile gaming is the most dominant game. game. So like things like Mobile Legends, Arena of Valor, um, the new Wild Rift that's coming out, Free Fire, PUBG Mobile, these are the games that are predominantly popular here, simply because not everyone can afford a high-end PC. Console gaming is still relatively behind. And the number one, it's kind of skipped a couple of steps and gone straight to mobile gaming. And so, um, you know, trying to push like an Overwatch product into Southeast Asia where not everyone has high-end PCs, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. And even like paying $30 for a game, is, it's a difficult thing as well, right? Because if you look at all the models that have been successful in Southeast Asia, they're all free to play 
or basically, you know, you pay to unlock certain characters. And that's been a big part of it, like pub, you know, so for example, Arena of Valor is a free to play game, same with Mobile Legends, same with Free Fire, same with PUBG. Um, but in saying that, I would say like for contenders, um, you know, Blizzard just basically fo focuses resources, Activision focuses resources onto areas where the viewership has been strong. I think uh, in Korea and in China, it's been relatively good, uh, the viewership still. Um, I think it's been hampered a little bit by the constant change of structure that Contenders has and the lack of support that it has simply due to the, I guess if you're an Overwatch League franchise and you pay $25 million for a slot, you'd hope that Activision spends most of the resources onto that versus Contenders where it's basically just a, um, you know, we, we receive prize money and that's about it, right? So it's, it's, it's very different. And I would say the difficult thing about Asia is just the fragmentation and every single market has different interests in different games. You know, John even mentioned like, you know, for example, PUBG Mobile, Reno Valor, and League of Legends are dominant in China. You know, you move to Japan and straight away, the games are different, right? Rainbow Six Siege, the fighting games are really, really popular. Um, you know, League of Legends to a certain extent. And then as you move down every respective country, it's just the popularity of the games change and it's driven by sort of the, the culture that's there and also just the what type of games that people are playing dependent on sort of the infrastructure that's available. And so, you know, certain publishers invest a lot more into certain regions. Um, and then you've seen that because basically the audience has grown. And then basically you've seen like, for example, Blizzard in Thailand, they've said are oh, pretty much from an Overwatch perspective, it's so difficult for us to be successful here. Um, let's try another, you know, let's try different opportunities or just go to other markets such as South Korea, China, where you have that strong viewer base and player base already. So I think it's the difficult thing is just that there's a significant amount of fragmentation, not only on games, but on platforms. And what I mean, like PC, console and mobile, it's just very, very different across every single country that you're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Walt, when we talked about this issue uh, about localization, you brought up an interesting point in our, in our own conversations off air uh, about how in North America, you're so often, it's so often a real estate game for localization. And you are not just competing against other esports teams for attention. In the US specifically, you're competing against the Boston Red Sox and Los Angeles Lakers. You're competing with Staples Center and Fenway. Can you go a little bit into that competition and what the challenges of it? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the way the way I, at least I view it is that we have our esports business, right, or a sports business, and you build sort of a real estate business around it. That's what you see for, like, say, the Stan Kroenke's, right? They own the Rams, and they've built a huge real estate development around it. SoFi Stadium, apartments, restaurants, office space, and things like that. And first of all, it's 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 not very possible for a TS team like us, TSM, to do that because it's a huge capital investment, right? To build out those stadiums, to build out all of that real estate, it costs you know hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars. Um, second of all, is that the stadium business and a venue business. Um, every single day that your venue doesn't have an event within it, you're losing money. It's a fixed cost, right? It's a fixed asset, and so every day it's dark. You're you're losing money, and so you have to be able to fill it with not only just esports games and esports matches and events, but concerts and other corporate events and all these type of things. But if you take a look at LA, if we were to build a, a TSM stadium in Los Angeles, I mean, we'd be competing with SoFi Stadium. We'd be competing with Staples Center, SoFi, uh, the Forum, and, and all these other stadiums. And it's already hard enough um, so it's, it's already hard enough to build a stadium and to compete with those stadiums. I think it's, a, it's, it's unrealistic uh, here in the United States. Um, and I think the third point is, is really that um, esports is so global, right? Um, and TSM, I don't really view it as a North American team. Honestly, it's a global esports organization. Uh, we have world championships every single year since our existence, and we compete internationally. We have teams in India. I mean, our PUBG mobile team is in India. Uh, we have players in Europe and teams in Europe, like uh, regular PUBG or Leffen, who plays Super Smash Brothers Melee. And so um, localization could be in the cards in the future because of uh, it's a very strong revenue stream. Uh, but right now, I don't think it's uh, super realistic for, for at least us in North America to pursue. Um, also in China, the stadiums are, I mean, they're, they're getting governmental support and they can fill them. I mean, to be fair, in, in China, a lot of the cities, they're, they're building venues that don't have as much competition, right? Here we're competing against the Staples Center. Over there in a lot of cities, those venues are being 
can be used for esports and other venues, and there's there's not as many of them. Um, so th those are those are my thoughts there. Yeah, uh, Sean, John, you guys unmuted. You want you want to add into that discussion? <laughs> uh, John. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, you know, I was just. I, well, I was. I didn't want to jump the gun into sponsors. Let's do it. Like you know what? Let's let's do it. So we've talked a little bit about how the influence of government subsidies and support from government seems to be different in the United States specifically uh, compared to a country like China or a country like South Korea. Uh, there seems to be subsidies and esports tourism and an emphasis on geolocation and ability to fill those local stadiums. So that's that's sort of one lens to approach the discussion of, oh, how is esports approached differently in the East rather than the West? Another lens is through sponsorship and business investment and partnership. Uh, so since yeah, you're already on the mic, John, let me throw this <laughs> over to you. Uh, what, like, let's, let's, let's go big picture here. If it, what is the biggest difference in your mind in the way that sponsors and partners invest in esports in the East compared to the way they do it in the West? Okay, so this is actually going to be elaborate toss to Sean and Walt. Um, <laughs> but, but basically... Yeah, so I, I just want to go back a little bit to Worlds just as a case study. Um, you know, uh, Worlds uh, probably it has the best. You know, it, it, look, there, there. It, it's it's hard not to talk about all the uh, everything else. It's not like World, like like League is the only thing. Uh, you know, uh, pu the the whole story of PUBG and Peacekeeper Elite in China is fascinating. Uh, but sticking on <laughs> sticking on 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 League. Um, you know, Worlds had 15 global brands going in uh, with Mercedes, MasterCard, Louis Vuitton, and that would be the same, you know, uh, anywhere, but it was doubled uh, for China uh, as opposed to uh, last year. So, okay, data point. Uh, the LPL itself has 15 uh, brands, has global brands, like uh, it has a huge Nike uh, partnership, multi-year partnership with, with Nike as its official apparel uh, sponsor, and Nike makes, makes good use of it. Um, uh, Mercedes, uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, KFC is a huge sponsor of, uh, uh, of, of the LPL, uh, and LPL teams, uh, in China, Oppo, Intel, HP, and then, you know, uh, local brands like Harvey and Brewery, et cetera. Um, the teams all now, now clubs, of course, live on sponsorship and I'm sure like Sean Walt can 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 talk talk to that but i just wanted to point out that something really interesting happened with worlds which is that you know everybody kind of loaded up on sponsors going in all those who qualified um you know they're they're uh you know sean and walt their teams qualified and they were I, i'm sure they they were busy because uh sponsors were, were were jumping on to these teams and even teams as they progressed through the matches uh when they got to a new stage could pick up new sponsors. So, so Suning, uh, you know, the, the finals between Suning uh, from, from China, from the LPL and Damwon uh, from Korea and Suning uh, locked up two sponsorships basically on the eve of the finals. One big one, a multi-year with KFC and a, a $1 million sponsorship for one match with uh, Row or uh, Rollway uh, Auto. Um, and then, you know, Suning is kind of this great example for something I, I wanted to, uh, this point that that Sean had made in our, our our earlier conversation, which is you know these it these teams are marketing opportunities for uh, for their owners. Uh, so Suning is one of the biggest e-commerce businesses, and uh, they own a team. Also, Jingdong is JD uh, JD.com is the uh, owner of a competing team, and those teams both made it. Uh, into into worlds and they had this uh, uh, you know, they had they they had a, a very you know a well anticipated match uh, between the b between the two of them and so it was like these two e-commerce companies against each other and after Suning won um, they uh, had a giveaway they gave they did a just to celebrate they gave away 100 million renminbi in uh, in e-commerce vouchers so I mean it. it and I think I'm just gonna like toss toss this Sean's way because uh, he made this point earlier about uh, you know a, about the ownership being looking a little bit different. Floor is yours, Sean. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Sorry, so it's just, yeah. <laughs> just leveraging off what John said, it's just basically a similar thing, particularly in China, right? If you look at all the um, many teams there, and people may not know, but like, for example, Billy Billy, uh, Leaning, uh, Top Esports, uh, JDG, Suning, uh, these are all ancillary multi conglomerate businesses that are in different sectors, right? You look at Billy Billy, the streaming platform that John mentioned. Li Ning is, is a sports apparel product. Top Esports actually does a distribution for Nike in China. And so what there was a really interesting article after Worlds that came out in China that was basically talking about how from a sponsorship perspective, like uh, Suning, obviously they own the team, but like Suning and JDG, for example, like their sales from Worlds and the marketing exposure that they got, given that you had you know that many, that many people watching the finals on the Chinese platforms, that it was a even if they spend 100 million renminbi a year on a, a squad, um, it's still cheap relative to the marketing expense that they would spend to achieve that type of reach and awareness that you would get from, from the regular season in the LPL and obviously all the additional tournaments that they did, you know, such as the, the M, I think it was the whatever MSS thing that they did between Korea and China and then also for Worlds, right? So it's actually an ancillary business to help support another business. And they did say in that article that both Suning and JDG sales during Worlds actually skyrocketed and, and, and Worlds was a means of a marketing expense for some of these brands. Now, from our perspective, I would say, you know, we don't have any other ancillary businesses. Sponsorships are a big part of it. Um, I would say the sponsorship conversations that we have are, uh, probably closer to what TSM is, um, where basically we just have brands come to us and, and sponsor us for a set fee, uh, whether it's value in kind or cash or a mix of whatever that is for um, sponsorships for a set period of time. And then basically we will deliver certain marketing uh, executables that we need to do. Not saying that obviously Suning and all those teams in China don't do that. They obviously do that because they're sponsored by other brands as well. It's just that um, they also have an overarching ownership that you know, if we need to invest more from a marketing expense, it's 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 relatively cheaper um, compared to just say, uh, you know, basically putting ads in the MTR or digital ads that they're running. So I would say that's a difference. And I think that's super interesting because what also the article said that many, many Chinese brands will now look at the LPL and esports as a means to promote ancillary businesses. So I would say, you know, there's many tech platforms, there's many multi-conglomerates in China that will now be looking at the LPL as a means to uh, market and promote their other businesses, which I think is, is an interesting sort of difference that you have definitely between sort of what we see from our esports conversations versus, let's say, probably some, a lot of the teams in China as well. Yeah. Walt, uh, from a North American's team's perspective, North American organization's perspective, do you share the same relationship with sponsors as teams in Asia do? Are you a marketing ex expense for massive conglomerates or is it different? No, no, it just comes out of my pocket, my wallet, you know, paying all these players. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's, um, you know, we don't have the same ownership structures as uh, here in North America as, as in China. All here in North America, a lot of the, I guess a lot of the esports teams are are all were are formed by you know private entrepreneurs and and they're entrepreneurs uh, since the early days. You look at Andy, who's the CEO and founder of TSM. He was used to be a player, then he founded a team, right? Jack, you know, Jack over at Cloud9 and Steve over at Team Liquid, um, and he which used to be Curse. Um, and so um, yeah, it's it's a very different ownership structure where here it's it's our sponsors are much more same thing as Sean, where it's just, they, they come to us, they want to, you know, promote their brands. Uh, they pay us a fixed fee to make videos, social media posts, uh, branding on the jerseys, things like that. And that, that is a significant part of our revenue stream. Um, and is actually our largest revenue stream on the, on the esports side. And so we, 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 we operate, you know, not as a, as, as a marketing company for, for these, uh, for ownership group, but instead as for our, for our paid partners. Uh, staying with the esports organization owners, I wanted to address something, I think a recent trend that I've personally been seeing in the market, which is the choice by some of the major organizations to begin to expand really uh, aggressively into other regions and to other and, and involve themselves with, you know, non uh, local sponsors to find that international reach. I'm thinking of South Korean teams like T1 and Gen G and F 
and a Chinese team like FPX starting to get into other regions' esports, and in the case of T1, actively partnering with Comcast Spectator, uh, a US-based company. And then conversely, there is a lot of attention uh, from the North American side to the massive audience that exists in a country like China or South Korea. Uh, Sean, I want to start with you because I think it's appropriate. One of your sponsors, in fact, part of the team is uh, is PSG, Paris Saint-Germain, the, the French uh, footballing organization. Can you talk about that relationship and, and the value that PSG brings an organization like yours? Yeah, um, sure, not a problem. So uh, PSG, in, in, in case you guys don't know, is, is one of the most, uh, I guess, established football teams in Europe. Um, they have, you know, right now, two of the biggest football stars in the world in, in Neymar and Mbappe, uh, for those who might not watch um, football. Uh, the League One league in, in, in France um, is, uh, I would say, not as popular in when it comes to viewership here in Asia compared to, let's say, the Premier League. The Premier League is the dominant sort of football asset that is, that is really, really strong in Asia. Um, and so what League what Paris thought was similar to, you know, they're quite innovative. They said similar things to, you know, when they did the Air Jordan brand to try and build the brand in the US. Um, what they said was, hey, if we want to build an audience in, in Asia, we need to be focusing on areas where, um, which is not exactly related to football. So, for example, they sponsor uh, the LGD team, um, PSG, LGD, Dota 2 team, if you guys are unaware. So that, that has been a PSG asset for a very, very long time. And then as of this year, we in, in June, July, we signed with them as well. Um, I would say from, from, from how they support us, I can kind of talk to the, like the four things. Firstly, from a sponsorship and revenue point of view, um, we are tapped into the PSG marketing engine and sort of partnerships team. Uh, if you go onto the PSG website, they have a list of, I don't know, like 50 sponsors or something like that. It's absolutely insane. But they, they basically provide us resources when they do deals with particular brands. If that brand is interested in doing opportunities in Asia, then they basically come to us and basically say, hey, guys, are you keen to work with, you know, American Express? Are you keen to work with McDonald's? Are you keen to work with Deliveroo? Because they've asked us that they want some sort of exposure in Asia as part of a sort of broader global package. And so that's definitely one on that. Um, on the performance side, we work very closely with them. So we spend uh, at least once or two trips a year where we go to France and sit down with their football teams and, and their various other teams such as judo and handball and basically learn how we can improve our operations from a back-end perspective, from performance management point of view to you know, become better when it comes to scouting, recruiting, retaining talent and developing talent from both you know, physical or aspects of sort of um, the, what we see as important. Um, marketing and social media, they support us on that. So if they want us to retweet something, they want to share something on Instagram, they basically support us on that. And lastly, on the merchandise, I've, you know, I've got a limited edition jersey uh, sort of t-shirt here from Nike and, and PSG that we did with them. And uh, we basically have the exclusive IP rights for uh, PSG talent branded clothing for Asia Pacific. So whatever we produce, as long as PSG approves it, we're allowed to sell it in this region. So I would say that partnership is quite strong and deep. They basically support us. We have direct lines into their whole back office um, and they're very invested into esports and building it out. So I would say like um, more and more sort of teams are, are looking to do that. And you even see like, for example, many sort of Western and European teams start to develop sort of presences here. You look at what Team Liquid has done in Japan, you know, focusing a lot on Street Fighter and Tekken 7. If you look at TSM, obviously PUBG Mobile and in India, even Fnatic has built a team in Thailand for PUBG Mobile. I think the audience here is undeniably massive. Um, I think China is a very competitive market to enter. And, and I think, uh, as you see, I haven't seen many teams try and uh, sort of develop that a little bit further. But I would say in Southeast Asia, given the cost and the ROI when it comes to eyeballs um, and, and brand awareness, that it makes a lot of sense to be pushing into this region because you know, eventually I think, you know, as you know, markets like Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand in Southeast Asia, and then if you look at North Asia, like Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, China, they're all huge markets where huge populations and governmental support and huge audiences, there's no reason why I think a lot of these brands should be looking into our region because um, although I'd, I'd like them not to come to our region, but I think uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity simply because of just the size and, and the support that um, and, and the interest that you have here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and briefly before we in, uh, encounter our last subject, uh, Walter, the uh, PSG, PSG talent is looking west is TSM looking east? Uh, obviously, you have the, uh, the the PUBG team in India, but what 
is it just viewership for you? What 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 are the benefits do you do you see of expanding into uh, the Asian region? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think you know to start off, you know, I, I we spoke briefly about how esports is much more of a global sport, right? Um, if you look at a lot a look at a lot of sports um, like fo American football or like basketball, it's 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 there are certain markets for it that are very big. But if you look at an esports team, it, could, it just can go anywhere and it can pick up multiple different teams, which is very, very unique. And it can make it's basically the most global sport in the entire world at this point. Um, you know, FC Barcelona could wish they could pick up a, a American football team and call it FC Barcelona, but they can't do that. But TSM can pick up has a have the has a North American LCS team. They can have a TSM PUBG mobile team in India, and they can have a, another mobile or esports team in, in in China called TSM. And so, at TSM, we're really trying to build the the biggest gaming brand in the world, and that means that we have to expand globally, and we have to look east because uh, that's where most of the eyeballs are. Um, and that's why you see us investing in, in PUBG Mobile in India. Um, and you'll see actually a lot more new investments from us uh, in multiple teams um, in, in the Asia Pacific region uh, next year. Awesome. Well, to sum up, we've sort of approached the question of what differentiates the East and the West in terms of their approach to esports through two particular lenses, through the government support uh, that Asia seems to enjoy, or some countries in Asia seem to enjoy, uh, compared to the way that Western governments have sort of uh, approached esports. And then also from a business perspective, how some massive Asian conglomerates will create uh, esports teams as a marketing arm to sell their product. Well, that really isn't the case in North America. You sort of rarely, if ever, see that. Undergirding these developments seems to be the case uh, that there is some sort of popularity for esports as a whole that exists in, in these countries, in, in the East uh, that we've been talking about, compared to the way that they are popular, societally accepted, perhaps, in the West. And this is a question that I'm going to open up to the entire panel, because this is the question in my mind. What has Asia done? What has China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South Korea done it, with regards to esports to create this sort of widespread popularity and dare I say societal acceptance that it feels like does not exist in the West compared to uh, speaking through the lens of business uh, development and uh, and and uh, business investment and government involvement. Uh, John, I want to start with you on this. What in your mind has created this uh, divergence, these differing levels of popularity? Um. Well, I'm just going to bring a couple up and I, uh, hopefully we can kind of crowdsource this, crowdsource this answer. But uh, uh, one thing is, um, let's take a look at, at traditional sports versus esports. And, it, and I think that that's, there's a kind of a generational difference around the world. I think that's more of just a more, more similar than anything else. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly, you know, in Asia, there, uh, you know, I, what I've, I've heard, what I've heard people say is, you know, there's just less opportunity to get into a, like say youth athletics. And, and so there's more of this kind of, um, uh, there, 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 there's more, you know, it might actually be more accessible to become an esports athlete than an athlete in, in a traditional sport. So that, that's sort of anecdotal. That's the, I don't really have any data on that. Um, what I do have data on is mobile. And mobile, as Sean pointed out, is huge and kind of, you know, the entire internet for uh, for lots of folks. So, uh, you know, the 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 numbers in 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 China, basically around 450 million. Uh, you know, uh, that's a that's a loose number. Uh, regularly watch or play core esports titles like um, uh, Peacekeeper Elite like um like honor of kings um uh like like crossfire uh th that and and of those there was a survey that said 86.3 percent um followed their favorite clubs weekly and that's a high level of engagement it's just a very high uh level of awareness of what esports is um you know walk down the street and just ask people if they know what esports is and and and, and you might get a different answer 
uh, you know, in, in, in the US. Uh, it's just a, a, a higher, I think that a higher level of penetration of awareness. Um, and, you know, I think that that, you know, I think that that follows from just a high level of gaming and mobile gaming. Uh, you know, 70% 70, 70 uh, Nico Research had this. They said 70% of, of gamers in China play esports games and 48% are female. And, you know, so that there's a sort of a, I don't know, a democratization, uh, if I can use that word, of, of gaming um, that that mobile brings. And and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm curious for the, for the rest of the panel, what they see uh, as, uh, you know, the influences of mobile on esports sort of, uh, you know, around, around the rest of the world. Uh, Sean, then Walter, and uh, be concise, guys, we're up against it. Yeah, sure. I think one of the key things is, is um, that has been really powerful in Asia is that, you know, similar to what John mentioned, like traditional sporting opportunities aren't, you know, as prevalent and also, you know, having Asian parents, like the main thing that they ask you to do is just study, 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 right? That's, that's the main focus that they've generally told us here in Asia. Now, the way that I feel like a lot of people have connected when it comes to school, when it comes to university, and if even if you look at the way League of Legends was distributed in China or in QQ.com, which is a basically like a WhatsApp social media platform, it's been gaming that's connected people, right? When you go to a new university, when you go to a new high school, the first thing they probably talk about or you can connect with is playing particular games. And I think that's what's created a lot of sort of uh, connection and, and, and sort of like um, sort of that thought process of, hey, I'm connecting with this group of people through gaming. Whereas, you know, I grew up in Australia and I moved to Hong Kong and, you know, the first thing that we would do getting to secondary school was like you just do sports three times a day, right? And that was the way you connected with your fellow teammates and how you built teamwork and camaraderie. And I think a lot in Asia um, is that's done in alternative platform simply because the opportunities are, are not there. And as a way to relieve from stress of the study that maybe your parents are asking you to do all the time is to actually just play games with your friends. And that was one way which we saw, like at least when I saw in China, the explosion of League of Legends, I think, you know, tying to QQ.com was a very smart move because it was a social, so it's a sort of chat platform and being able to leverage, hey, let's go play a game of League of Legends. Um, that, that's something that's very powerful, I felt, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, to wrap up this panel, maybe I could talk a little bit from a very macro perspective, right? Total global consumption in 2019 for the box office for all movies was about $41 billion. For music, it was about $33 billion US dollars globally. For video games, it was $120 billion US dollars in 2019. By the end of 2020, total global consumer spending on video games will be hit about 170 to $180 billion. The growth is staggering. So if you think about that, in my opinion, in our company's thesis, video games is going to be the largest entertainment medium in the world, if it isn't already. A TV, pay TV, probably a little bit higher right now. But video games, in my opinion, will be the biggest game uh, entertainment medium in, in, in the future. And so I think for, for all the people who are listening on the panel and for Sean and for John, I mean, we're, we're in this giant tidal wave that is going to lift all our, all our, all our boats. And we're just going to see, you know, who's positioned the best to, 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 to make the most of this rising tide. Fantastic. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted questions for the Q&A. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we won't be able to do that this time around. Uh, but on behalf of all my panelists today, Sean, John, Walter, guys, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us here at Asia Society. Another fantastic panel. Uh, and... I am very thankful for Asia Society for inviting me back after the first one. Uh, but to close us out, uh, we have Charlie Coker to come back with some final remarks. Have a good night, everyone. Or good morning Thanks, or good afternoon. Miles, thank you very much to you and, and Sean and, and John and, and Walter for an amazing discussion about the, the world of esports. Um, we'd like to thank you for participating, you know, coming back and participating in our entertainment summit, our US Asia Entertainment Summit this week. As you know, <laughs> You know, we live in interesting times and due to the pandemic, we've changed our usual format of how this works as, as a week long event, instead of having it on a all the day one day event. Um, and uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors who've hung in there with us um, to, uh, to pivot to the new digital world, Paul Hastings, Manat, Walt Disney Imagineering and O'Melveny. Um, they've been very gracious and very supportive of moving to our, um, our new format. 
And uh, I think we'll be, we'll, we hope to see everybody live next year, but when this happens again uh, in November, but we will in this kind of um, pandemic environment be putting on events throughout the year, um, probably on a monthly or quarterly basis. And hopefully we would love to have, have you all back again and to, and to delve deeper in, into the world of esports and other aspects of esports. Um, because like, like uh, Walter said, it really is the new media and will become the dominant media, one of the dominant media businesses uh, globally in the near future, if, it has, if it's not already. So um, again, I'd like to thank every, I'd like to thank our promotional partners as well, uh, American uh, Chamber of Commerce Shanghai, the Asian Business League of Southern California, um, the, the New Filmmakers LA, uh, the USC Marshall School of, of uh, Business, the IBEAR MBA program, um, as, and, and, and the other partners that, we've, that were up on your screen right now. Um, and then also, we'd like to uh, let you know that we'll be having another program. The, this was the third in our program for this week, and we will be having a fourth program later in about, actually in about an hour from now. Um, uh, the, being, being the global organization that we are, we have a program with Indonesia, which had to be at 6 p.m. tonight, Pacific time. And so we'll be talking about the rise of Indonesia's entertainment industry and hope that you will come back and join us for that. If not, hopefully you'll join us for our programs that we'll be having tomorrow and Friday, which will be the conclusion of our um, summit week. So thanks again to Miles and Sean and John and Walter for their uh, amazing panel. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys all again soon. Thank you so much and have a good night.